you go into different things where you can go into therapy, you can do psychological assessments, you can work with different hospitals or outpatient clinics and work with different professionals like psychiatrists or even medical doctors. What's up fam? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Phil Sarpon. If this is your first time here, this is Phil's guide to PsyD. This channel is dedicated to all things clinical psychology. If you are interested in psychology, if you care about self-care and wellness, or if you want a little bit of a sneak preview into what grad school might look like for you, then this channel is for you. So today I'm super excited because we are actually going to be going over 18 specialties that you can do with clinical psychology, all right? Now, a number of these we've actually already mentioned before in previous videos, and there's no way that I could actually go in detail for each specialty in this video, but overall, we'll just kind of go through just a brief overview of each specialty in this video. All right, so I've talked a lot about this, and that's clinical neuropsychology, and so that's going through either a PsyD or a PhD program in neuropsychology and then after that doing a one-year internship and then going into a two-year postdoc and doing a number of things related to neurological disorders like epilepsy and dementia. All right, so clinical health psychology is kind of a new one and not every program might have this specific focus, but it's actually really cool. You usually are going to work in clinical work sites, whether it's a hospital or an outpatient setting, but the populations that you might work with are anywhere from people that are going through some type of weight management, tobacco use, pain management, and even some type of psychological adjustment to some type of chronic disease. So you are working with nurses and nurse practitioners and PAs and doctors. Basically, you are included in terms of helping people in terms of their overall function, combining their health as well as their psychological health. So some of the things that you can do with health psychology is that you can do psychological assessment for personality assessments. You can also go into intervention and health promotion, basically going into different communities, whether it's schools or government sites or organizations and promoting health psychology, promoting the use of psychology. You can also do consulting for different companies as well as evaluation in terms of helping someone with their overall health plan. All right, so that is health psychology. Now the next one is psychoanalysis. Now you may have heard of psychodynamic therapy. Psychoanalysis is its own specialty. And what's really cool about psychoanalysis is that it is basically has an overview for any type of population, any type of demographic. One of the things that's really different about psychoanalysis is that you may have a patient that could be with the therapist for a number of years. So that's very different than something like CBT or DBT or other different types of cognitive therapies that are usually implemented for like 12 week programs or 12 sessions or different things like that. They're usually more short term. Whereas psychoanalysis is, you could have a patient or a client for years and years and years. One of the really cool things about psychoanalysis is that it's expanded from a primary focus of individual therapy to now expanding into group therapy, family therapy, and even couple therapy. One of the really cool things is that research is actually being shown to support the use of psychoanalytic uses in terms of clinical practice. And the awesome thing is that not only is psychoanalysis being used to assess cognitive and emotional functioning, but there's a number of different things that psychoanalysis will use to basically look at the present and past functions and disorders and traumas of different individuals. All right, so next up we have school psychology. School psychology is really cool. We've actually done a video about this in the past, but there's a number of different ways to become a school psychologist. There's actually a number of different certifications to become a school psychologist. You can actually become a school psychologist with only a master's degree, and you don't have to necessarily have to get a, a PsyD or a PhD or even a doctorate in education. So there's actually a number of different ways to become a school psychologist. Obviously, one of the, the biggest populations that school psychologists are going to serve is going to be students, children, teens, high school, college, things like that. School psychology is actually really cool because they can go way more on terms of the prevention and intervention side. All right, so they can help with developmental, educational, and psychological well-being, and also crisis intervention for certain situations that happen in schools. They do consulting with parents, with teachers, with administrators. They do a number of different psychological services, like I mentioned, and they have basically an overall developmental program to help children and kids as they go through their life in terms of school and education and things like that. 
Next up, we have clinical psychology, which is something that I'm actually on the pursuit of. I've mentioned this obviously in several videos, but clinical psychology, you can either get a PsyD or a PhD. You go into different things where you can go into therapy, you can do psychological assessments, you can work with different hospitals or outpatient clinics and work with different professionals like psychiatrists or even medical doctors. There's a number of different things that you can do with clinical psychology, whether it's research or teaching based or even on the industrial side where you do a lot of consulting. So that is basically what clinical psychologists do. Another specialty which is similar to the clinical psychology side is actually going to be child and adolescent clinical psychology. So basically they would do anything and everything that a clinical psychologist would do but they do it specifically for child and adolescents all right another specialty is that we have counseling psychologists counseling psychologists will go through a usually a phd program in order to become psychologists one of the things about counseling psychologists is that they are very similar to clinical psychologists they may just work with a different population, but essentially they're taught all of the same things in terms of psychological assessments. They go through research, they go through statistics, they go through teaching, they can become teachers, they become researchers, they can do a number of things that clinical psychologists can do. They may just so focus on different populations. And so there's not a ton of difference between counseling psychologists and clinical psychologists. The education's just about the same. It takes just the same number of years. They also have to go through the same licensure program and things like that. So that is basically what counseling psychologists will do, but they are also another specialty of the psychology realm. Next up, we have industrial organizational psychology. Now you may have heard of this field. This is one of those fields that is becoming very popular, but this is sort of in the realm of consulting. These psychologists may actually have full-time jobs and be doing industrial organizational psychology on the side, right? So it's more of an independent contractor where companies or organizations may hire these psychologists to come in. Maybe they have a toxic workplace. Maybe they have some employee just dissatisfaction. Maybe they just have some issues with their company. And so these psychologists may come in and try and help alleviate some of the trauma or some of the issues that are going on in the workplace. They could also go into universities. They can go into schools. They can go into whatever organization they're is to help alleviate some of basically just some psychological dysfunctions in the workplace and things like that. One of the really cool things that I, I like about industrial organizational psychologists is that they actually will perhaps go way more into the business side, right? So they're assessing consumer preferences, they're studying basically customer satisfaction, they're looking at marketing strategies, they're helping to coach employees, they actually might even coach CEOs in terms of helping them run their company and run their organization. So they're definitely way more behind the scenes. They actually help a lot of companies grow and develop when they're selling their products and things like that. There's also something called behavioral and cognitive psychology. You guys may have heard of ABA. So these psychologists are definitely really focused on behavior. They may be focused on behavior of adolescents and children or perhaps specialized populations like autism and things like that. And so they're going through assessments with these populations, they're going through psychological services and they will still go through either a PsyD or a PhD program to become a behavioral and cognitive psychologist. Some of the problems that they may address is anxiety, depression, substance abuse, health related problems, even some trauma or even some stress management. All right, so they're really working with individuals in terms of progressing in terms of just daily living. Next up, we have forensic psychology. Now, this is one that you may not have heard, but they are very prevalent and common, especially in the legal system for lawyers or judges that are trying to assess different psychological assessments and different mental health disorders of different clients and things like that. They may refer to a, a legal forensic psychologist in order to assess an individual. And so forensic psychologists may work in prisons, they may work in the legal system, they may be sort of uh, consulting for different lawyers in terms of the work that they do for cases. One of the basically the biggest things that they will do is that they want to create relevant, accurate, and credible data and conclusions that inform legal arguments and judicial decision making. And so as you can see, the, the work is pretty intense, but it is definitely needed in terms of certain cases and such like that. And so that is 
uh, a little bit of an overview of what forensic psychology could include. All right, another specialty is couple and family psychology. This is one that you can definitely specialize in just like the name is in the title, you're gonna be working with couples and families. And so you would do anything that a psychologist would do. You'd go through the still the PsyD or the PhD program. You'd work specifically with this population. You'd specialize in this field and you'd work uh, essentially going through assessments, going through therapy with couples or children or families in general as a whole together. Gerald psychology is working with older adults, the geriatric population. There's a number of things that is really gonna be needed as the population just in general in the world gets older and older where psychologists are going to be needed to assess different biological, psychological, social changes for older adults and so the, the prime mode of this is that they are going into interventions and looking at aging services and prevention and health promotion for a lot of the geriatric population. Some of the problems that they may address might be related to dementia, it might be related to personality dysfunctions as well as coping with chronic illness, as well as grief and loss, and also even just family caregiving status. And so there's a number of things that are involved in the geriatric population that psychologists can definitely give their services to. Next up is police and public safety psychology. And just like the name suggests, this is actually one that I didn't really know about until I started doing the research on it, but they work with police and public safety. And so they may work in a number of different psychological functions in terms of assessment. And so, for example, one of the things that they may do is that they may offer operational support. So this could include hostage negotiation and even criminal investigation support. Next up is sleep psychology. So yes, you can actually become specialized in sleep psychology. This is actually fairly new, but as sleep issues are becoming more prevalent in adults, even to younger adults, there has definitely been opening up spaces for psychologists to work in this field, whether people are going through some normal or disordered sleep, whether they're going through different sleep cycles, sleep deprivation, they're basically these psychologists are helping them with sleep regulation in a number of different ways, utilizing cognitive treatments, behavioral and even non-medication treatments to help their clients have better sleep cycles. And so if this is something that you might be interested in, you know, I think this definitely delves into the realms of a little bit of neuropsychology and the brain and things like that. So there's a number of research involved. There's also a number of different cognitive therapies involved. All right, so next up we have rehabilitation psychology. So this one is actually gonna be working with different people in different population settings that are going through different injuries in clinical settings and helping them to recover from injury, perhaps traumatic injuries. So this could include anything that's debilitating, perhaps chronic, perhaps even just any type of disability. So there's gonna be so, sort of emotional coping mechanisms, mental coping mechanisms, and even relating and regulating psychological status. Next up, there's also a specialty devoted to group psychology and group psychotherapy. And so just like the name sounds, you're only working with groups. And so this could be related to substance abuse, perhaps sort of like an Alcoholics Anonymous group where you're working with substance abuse addicts and things like that. You're getting them into one location. You're working with different individuals in sort of this group setting. And what's great about this is that a number of different psychological disorders can actually benefit from group therapy. So the next one is serious mental illness psychology. Now this is one I also didn't actually have any idea about. I actually had to do a little bit more research, but SMI, which is called serious mental illness, is anything that's related to any type of uh, trauma or really intense mental health illness. And so psychologists could actually specialize in this field. One of the things that they can address in terms of problems is they can help individuals, but they can also help with societal issues as well, and even work with different systems and organizations in terms of helping with serious mental illness. Next one is clinical psychopharmacology, guys. So as the name sounds, this one is also related into way more in terms of the medication. Now, I already kind of mentioned this before in previous videos, but most PsyD and PhD schools won't go super in depth into medication. Most likely, as you become a psychologist, you'll actually have to take additional certifications and make sure that you actually get approved in terms of your state guidelines in terms of actually prescribing medication. And so clinical psychopharmacology is this whole different realm that you could technically specialize in 
in terms of just specialized knowledge in terms of how to prescribe medication to the right patients and things like that. Some of the populations that they could work with is ADHD, depression, anxiety, panic attacks, and even PTSD. And so I got all of this information from the APA, American Psychological Association. So all of these specialties have been, are legit, they are approved by this association. Some of the things that I actually did not mention is the subspecialties, which includes things like addiction psychology, sports psychology, and biofeedback and applied psychology. And so those are three subspecialties within sort of the major specialties. So in short, guys, one of the biggest things, one of the most commonalities between all these specialties is that most likely you will need a PsyD or a PhD. You will need an actual doctorate to actually do, go into some of these specialties. But the nice thing is that once you do have the doctorate, you can do a number of different programs or certifications or workshops to get on additional certifications in order to actually specialize in these, in these fields. And what's cool is that if you have an interest or if you have a population that you specifically want to work with, you could do that with a number of these specialties. So put it down in the comment section below if any of the specialties caught your interest that you want to go into, that you want to actually study out and do more research in. I encourage you, I mean, this video was kind of a long video, but I, there's no way that I could actually go in depth with any of these specialties. So this is sort of just an overview of all the specialties that are out there all of them that are APA approved. And who knows, maybe you can actually look into some different PsyD or PhD programs that may actually have some of these specialties or even some of these subspecialties, all right? So again, if you have any questions, definitely put it down in the comment section below. If you haven't already, definitely like and subscribe to this video. But with that, I will see you guys in the next video.